Welcome everyone. My name is Josh Campbell. I'm the CEO of Techonomy Media. Uh, we really uh, appreciate you joining us uh, today for be a great conversation with uh, Rashad Tabakawala. In a second, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Drew Ayani of CDX who will be conducting the interview. Great. Thanks so much, Josh. Uh, welcome everybody um, from wherever you are. I hope you are all well, staying safe and healthy. Um, and uh, Rashad, it's, it's great to see you. I always prefer to see you in person at our conferences and elsewhere out there. Um, but uh, this will have to do until we can all get back together in person. Uh, and I know you're very busy. Just finished a book, writing some more. Uh, so thanks again. I know you're very busy. And thanks for taking the time. Thank you for both inviting me and for everybody who's listening, watching. It's, indeed. And, and so, Rashad, I'll just start. How are you? Where are you? You know, how, how are you coping? I am uh, in Chicago where it has decided to snow on April 15th. So there's a lot of snow That's about right. on, on the ground. Uh, I am fine. Our daughters who live in New York are fine. My wife still tolerates me and I'm sitting at home. For the longest period of time in my life, I've not been on a plane. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, you know, before we jump in, I, I'm just sort of curious, you know, um, you know, you're, in terms of your daily routine, you know, what, what are you doing, you know, since the crisis started, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's educating yourself, relaxing, um, you know, something that's helping you personally sort of, you know, get through this on a day-by-day -day basis? My sense is that I, I've, I continue to do certain things, but do it every day. So I have this habit of waking up at 4.30 in the mornings just to study for an hour and a half. And that used to only happen when I was in Chicago. But now it happens yeah. because I'm in Chicago every day. So I'm learning a yeah. lot more. I try to do one new thing and it's a little hard to do a one new thing when you go outside. So I subscribe to a channel called Criterion, which is probably the best movies ever. Mm -hmm. I strongly encourage that. And I figured out that going up and down the seven floors of the parking lot in my building, each round trip is a mile. So I do that four or five times every morning. Well, that's, that's great. I, um, so let's jump in a little bit here. And, and um, I know you just wrote a, a book, um, Restoring the Soul of Business, and I want to get to that. Um, but uh, you have also been uh, posting on Medium and elsewhere You've been talking about this thing, this thing called the Great Reinvention, as as it relates to, to what's happening today. So, you know, I'd love for you to share a little bit about that sort of top line and and where did that come from, and and what are those sort of core tenets from the the Great Reinvention, and then we'll we'll dig in a, a little bit further. Definitely. So, uh, all of us remember two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, and that was sort of known as the Great Recession. And then 1929, people were talking about the Great Depression, which most of us were not around for. Um, and in many ways, this is uh, different in a, unlike a lot of the stuff that I've lived through over the last 40 years, which is 2000 or 40 business years of you know, 2008, 2009, or 9 11, or uh, the dot com bust. Uh, this is very different because, A, it is happening to everybody in the world at the same time. And nothing like that has basically happened. Uh, again, most of us went around in the Great Depression, but it's happened to everybody all at the very same time. The other one is all the previous ones were either a usually an economic crisis of some sort, uh, and in 9-11, it was basically some sort of, sort of political social crisis. All of them obviously were tragic. This one is basically a political, it is a financial, and most importantly, it is a humanitarian crisis. So it's the equivalent of an asteroid hitting the earth, and it's the equivalent of taking all of those and scaling it up. So I don't believe using financial terms is the right thing. It's to think, rethink everything which is why I call it right. the great reinvention. Now, one of the key things that I've studied is habits and behavior. And you can plan to do anything you want, but you don't actually do it unless you do it day after day, or you can decide to stop doing something and you don't stop it unless you stop it day after day. What we don't realize is most of us for 60 to 90 days are either starting to do things or stopping to do things. And therefore we are forming new habits. Right. And that's one. And therefore, we're going to come out with this great reinvention. 
And while everyone uses certain terms, and so the emotional terms people are using is anxiety. We're sort of anxious for our health. There is uncertainty because we don't know when this is going to end. And there is fear. There is obviously fear for our loved ones, but fear for our jobs, our livelihoods, etc. But I've sort of looked at it and thought about the great reinvention with a term called fragility. So my whole basic belief is we have to address fragility. And what this has shown is that we are fragile as human beings, obviously, because we can get ill and something can come and hurt us. But we're also fragile as a society. So in, for instance, 15% uh, of all, uh, 15 to 16% of the United States is immigrants. Currently, the people who are working on the front lines, whether they're in hospitals, delivery, et cetera, 30% are immigrants. In the city of Chicago, the population of Chicago, about 30% of Chicago is African-American. 72% of the deaths of COVID-19 is African-American, right? So what we're now basically beginning to see is all the fractures and the fault lines of society are also showing up. And then economically, when you think about the fact that most families don't have enough money to last two or three weeks, but what is also really weird is companies like Boeing, the exact amount of money they're now asking from the government, they paid back in buying back their shares the last two years. Right. So there's a, there's, there, there's, a, there's a very interesting thing, which is like, what the hell was everybody thinking? Right. So, as a result, coming out of this, the only way to sort of address fragility is we have fragility at the society level, fragility at the human level, and fragility in the business economic level, is that all messaging and everything else moving forward should be recognizing that this is what people will be looking for. Safety, right? right? Mm -hmm. Which is, am I safe? Security, both economic and other security. And then what's the implication on society? And as a result, we're gonna have significant changes around the world over the next two or three years, which is why I call it the great reinvention. Um, indeed, and, and let's start a little bit macro in the corporation and then we can start to dive in from, from sort of the marketing and the, looking at the future consumer and the impact of this on, on that consumer. You know, we, we've, we, we certainly know that there was the business round table, right? And, and all the signatures from all the executives and, and, and concerning yourselves with multiple stakeholders and not just shareholders, right? It's not just about shareholder value. A lot of people thought is that, you know, great, thank you for sending that out, but is it lip service? Um, but now here we are and we see a lot of great actions from corporations. Um, will this just accelerate that? Will we come out on the other side of, of, a, of a redefining, is it a reinvention of capitalism? You know, at, at the most sort of macro level and, and the mo what, what does the modern day corporation look like in that regard when we come out of this? Well, you know, just like the modern day corporation today has many flavors, I would anticipate it will continue to have many flavors. But I would expect that the next corporation will, which is the piece I'm now writing, will uh, sculpt into it resilience. So I think both society, companies, and people will be sculpting resilience into the company. So we will be retransforming resilience. So at the business level, what do I think that's going to happen? The first thing is most companies are going to basically make sure that they now have a rainy day fund, right? They're going to make sure that they have enough in, I mean, the reality of it is every company, including the company that I used to work for, Publicis, have drawn down their entire credit lines. Publicis right. just drew down $2 billion of credit line, which they didn't even need. Boeing drew down, everyone's just drawing down credit line, right? Which basically says, A, they're expecting this to be worse than most people expect, but B is they don't know if the money will be their day after tomorrow. So their whole stuff is, I, whether I need it or not, I'm taking credit lines. That costs money. It costs it in you know, depressed stock because people ask you what the hell and you, you have to pay interest rates. Uh, you know, something like Airbnb, the celebrated Airbnb, they just borrowed a billion dollars at 11 and a half percent. Okay. So what people are going to say is like, this sucks. And, and if, if, that, if, the, if the board doesn't realize it, people are going to recognize that that's one for a, sort of financial resilience. The other resilience they're going to basically have is they're going to actually have to have more money because taxes are going to go up, if, right? Definitely corporate taxes are going to go up. This corporate tax cut that we recently enjoyed, that's gone because someone's gonna to have to pay for all of this. So there's gonna be that cost. So we have to have resilience in that. And there's gonna be resilience of supply chains. For most people, this just in time and relying on China doesn't work that well, right? right. 
But therefore, if you have resilient supply chains, which are different than efficient supply chains, that's going to cost money. So businesses are going to be sculpted. The other thing they're going to basically do is they're going to try to keep their costs as low as possible with the flexibility of going up, up thing. So as many people as possible will try to have less full-time workers and more flexible and contract workers. Interestingly, the technology companies have already done this. So of right. the 220,000 people working at Google, 125,000 are contract workers. So there'll be the sculpting of resilience, which will be very interesting in companies, whether it's supply chain, financing, employment, uh, housing, everything. Right. And what of the what of the unicorns and some of these celebrated startups? And I mean, does WeWork even come back, like at all? Like so, and and, and other unicorns and things like that. So you know, uh, my sense is that WeWork had three problems. They, they had one problem to begin with, and their biggest problem was what I call hallucinatory economics, okay? So if you have enough marijuana, which their CEO had, you can create an economic model. <laughs> and then you have someone who has delusions but launches a fund called the SoftBank Vision Fund, which really is a delusion fund, right? They had an economic model that made no sense. And I know a lot about economics and there's no way I could make any of this make sense. But now they have two other problems, which is they have a audience or which is their market problem, which is a lot, yes, they do, they do create spaces for large companies, but most of the stuff that they created were for smaller dot, you know, unicorn, not un, hoping to be unicorn and small five person, six person companies or people like myself, if I needed to, you know, now I'm a company of one, if I'm feeling lonely, I could go and hang out and read <laughs> right? What happens is most people now recognize a, most of us are feeling poorer these days and we're working from home and we don't need no we work. So in effect, they have that. And then the more importantly, their business model has fallen apart because unless they basically bathe you in Purell before you enter, people won't want to work in those dense spaces because their business model was basically to fit you into 75 square feet, which makes no sense. So they have an economic model that's destroyed a target model that's destroyed, a business model that's destroyed. So I basically believe that you're going to basically see them slowly go out of business. And unfortunately, that is going to impact real estate in major, major cities. And, and how do you feel about other, you know, startups, whether they're unicorns or not, and, and, you know, and the, and the prospects for startups that say they have a great product and a great business model and great market potential. Um, you know, we work and some of the unicorns are, are particularly ones out of SoftBank might be outliers, maybe not. Um, but what about, you know, just, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an old agency guy and I want to start something up. Uh, you know, just startups in general, how will so, they succeed? moving? So I, I think what is tending to basically happen is right now, the people who are succeeding are people who have lots of cash. So the, the reality of it is if you are a startup and you've managed to raise money and you know how to husband it, you've got you know, because this, it, this entire thing is basically a play for time. So people are basically saying, what's our burn rate and how much money do we have? So if you're a startup, it's very hard to raise money. What I'm hearing is it's really hard to raise money. So if you've got money, right, and you've got a runway of about 18 months, then it's fine. Otherwise, it's really, really hard. The problem really is startups require something called talent, right? Any company requires talent. But startups basically manage to get a disproportionate share of talent, primarily because of two reasons. One is there was potentially a payoff on the other end because of equity and a whole bunch of other stuff and an environment that made you feel that you were in a college dorm. I mean, that was, you know, it was basically, I've not really graduated from college, right? And I potentially could have this thing. Now the, the, the reality of it is most companies fail, but now it's become very clear. You'll see all these failures and what you're already seeing and what I heard from a lot of people, including Scott Galloway, when he spoke on Pivot, is he and his, from his own startup, he's losing people to the large established companies because people are saying, I want now safety. Remember safety, security, right? right. So they're going to have a hard time attracting talent unless they show they've got a lot of cash. But right. most startups tend not to have cash. And most of these unicorns are going to become popcorn. Okay? That's what I think, right? We're going to have unicorn, it'll be replaced by popcorn. And right. unfortunately, 
that popcorn is not the popcorn that's going to be sold at theaters because I don't think people are going to go and buy $8 buckets of popcorn. One of the things, if you notice in your grocery store is popcorn is usually empty. It's like toilet paper. People are buying popcorn while Netflixing. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a little about the consumer. And, and I encourage everybody to send uh, Josh, our host, directly a, a message with your question. Ultimately, this is for all of you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the consumer here on the other side, and then I want to get it out to questions. So, Rashad, so go going with that, you know, um, we had Rita McGrath last week, and I think she's on here, and, and she had a great quote, um, all consumer spending is up for grabs every dollar, every yen, every euro. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, consumers and, and how they're going to behave. We've talked about security being important. We've talked about their health. Um, what are some of your thoughts on, on what that consumer landscape, you know, looks like, you know, as we, we start to come out of this? And I suppose we're going to have a pre-vaccine and a post-vaccine sort of you know, universe, but um, share with us some of your thoughts along these lines. So I, I think the, 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 the first thing to sort of recognize, and I do agree that uh, almost everything is up for grabs, but I'm going to sort of use the, the word I tend to basically use, which is I use human and people versus consumers, because I've always believed that when you try to understand people as consumers, you miss everything. You know, I've always said that even PNG, which is an incredible company, at heart, everything that they do is they remove dirt. So they understand if they if they if they understand people as consumers, they understand my dirt removal habits, you know, from my right. butt, from my teeth, from my house. But that's right. not the way I define right. myself. So right. I try to use the word people or humans. And 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 because what is tending to happen is I think a majority of people, not everybody, but a majority of people, will be coming out of this with a newfound focus, right? Mm -hmm. And, and we don't know how long this focus will last, but there will be a newfound focus. And there are three characteristics of this focus. The first focus is, I got to figure out what the hell is important to me. Because it's not that every one of us has got this, but because you know everywhere you see people with mass, this is probably the largest mass near death experience many of us have had, okay? And usually when someone gets very ill in your family or you get ill, you actually start thinking, okay, what's important to me? So a lot of people are going to say, what's important to me in life? Not what is important to me in what I buy, but what's important to me in life. Um, not everybody, but quite a group of people will basically do that. Yep. Agreed. The second is they're going to basically say, why was I doing what I was doing? And what should I now focus on instead? Right? Because for instance, there's a lot of stuff that I was doing, including like flying all over the place for having a one hour, two hour meeting. My whole right. stuff is... I'm just doing that with everybody, including boardrooms right now, and I don't lose anything, right? And they don't even know on the side I'm eating popcorn, right? right? So, <laughs> right. So, 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 so the idea basically is people are going to rethink because of these new habits or behaviors. Either you stopped or you started things. And then when it comes down to basically what they're going to spend on, um, I have a feeling that they're going to basically, there's a group of people who are going to say, what can I cut? Because I now realize that I'm living in a little bit more of a fragile world. While others will basically say, let me seize on the most amazing experiences that I possibly can. So certain things that we have lost, right? Like a lot of people like sports and going to ball games and a whole bunch of other stuff. They'll really want to do that, right? And they may even pay a premium because in many ways, if you have social distancing and you only allow one third of the people in there, it'll be those kinds of stuff. So that will be one of the th key things that will happen. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I'm expecting, which is the one that I both as a business person, as a marketer, are most concerned about when, right, but I'm aware of, is I think every single person with the exception of certain categories like Purell or other places have lost all pricing power. Okay, because what has happened is people have reset their pricing because a lot of people have started doing stuff for free. A lot of behavior power has changed. So the, the likelihood of me, and I basically, I'm one of these like AB, you know, AMC members that pays 1985 right. for unlimited number of movies and stuff like that, or 12 movies a thing. The, the reality of it is you, you start thinking, why am I doing this? So I think you're going to have a lot of behaviors. I think the movie industry is going to be completely changed. I think the restaurant industry is going to be completely changed. I think the ability for people to just say, hey, I'm going to charge this exorbitant price. So unless you deliver potentially great value, it's going to be an issue. So I anticipate there's going to be a resetting of costs and revenue that is much broader than what most people basically think, Right. Uh, it's, it's just it's going to basically happen. And so in effect, I am going to basically 
ask for deals everywhere. Yeah. No, <laughs> right. The, the discount economy, right? Yeah. Um, so let's, um, before we get to questions, um, I want to release some of the results of the poll here. So Josh, I'll let you uh, take a, take that on. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Drew. So, so yeah, so, you know, you guys, uh, you know, about 70% of you answered the questions and I think Rashad to your, uh, you know, sort of last comment, you know, especially hospitality, you know, restaurants, travel, um, you know, this is really telling, right? You know, 36% of the people said I'll you know, dine in restaurants less than I did previously. 35% um, said I'll travel rent less. Um, I'll shop in physical stores less. So, you know, everyone here is agreeing that they're, they're, they anticipate their behavior to radically change uh, once we, we come out of this. Um, additionally, to your comments on WeWork and, and sort of flexible workspace, uh, you know, obviously the trend here, 54% of the people who responded saying that they'll work from home more than they did previously. Uh, mm -hmm. So a huge factor uh, on probably real estate and, and, and work. Um, oh, this is great. Really good results. Thanks everybody for participating. Very insightful. And we'll consolidate those and send them to you as well. Um, so Josh, I'd like to get out. This is for everybody here at the end of the day. So let's get out to some questions. Sure. The first, we'll, uh, we'll go to a, a good longtime friend, uh, Dave Morgan, who uh, I believe probably Rashad and Drew you both yeah. know well. Hey, Dave. Uh, Dave, Dave, you're hey, on. Hey, guys. Rashad, thank you so much for, for doing this. And your book is extraordinary and uh, glad to hear your family's well. Um, I would be remiss in talking about your great reinvention if we didn't talk a little bit about uh, the industry and organization which you have most recently uh, graduated from. Um, how do you see the great reinvention hitting advertising businesses and particularly the large holding companies? Um, you talk about drawing down large, you know, the, the, you know basically pulling down uh, uh, cash credit lines, but you know, what do you think about the businesses? So I'll speak broadly and obviously on publicists uh, for the last six, seven months, I don't know anything more than what I read in the newspaper, believe it or not. I keep it, I go out of my way not to be informed uh, <laughs> and I'm not on the board and I'm not on anything. So I just talk broadly about the industry, uh, especially the larger companies. Um, so I, 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 I do believe that it will, that the fundamental thing of helping clients rethink their business will be what will still be very, very important. I believe storytelling and brands will continue to be important, but how those are developed and uh, will we'll keep shifting as it has. With that being said, I sense that most of the larger companies will be smaller as we move into the future. Um, and the reason I think we will be smaller is because most of the business models of large companies is um, we, pay on a FTE basis. So we get paid on an FTE basis, which is you know, the number of people working in a particular business. And the truth of the matter is that as at least the next two, one or two years, there's going to be sort of a decline in fees and decline in spending broadly. Obviously some groups will spend more and some groups will spend less. I think the business will be smaller. And I think there'll be more use of flexible work uh, even though right now every company is cutting freelancers and contractors, et cetera. Uh, and I also believe that there will be uh, less on the, on the other side, I think, remember there was a tendency uh, or one of the threats for the companies were the in-housing of, of agencies. So clients taking agencies in-house, right? Which I always thought, even though I was working in an agency, but even forgetting that, was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard in my life because of a whole bunch of things, right? And that has been proved without a doubt to be the stupidest idea in the world. Because now you basically have, outside of the fact that you have a bunch of irrelevant people with irrelevant talent, but you can't fire us at 30 days. You got to give them a year's severance, okay? So you've added cost structure when you shouldn't add cost structure. You remove flexibility when you can't add flexibility. And when the world of marketing changes, you've got one set of people. There is a reason for other people besides your own company. So I think that's the good side, but I think it's going to be very challenging and it's going to be primarily challenging also because on the mix that you tend to have. So businesses that have a lot of business that has to do with travel and a lot of these categories that'll be slow will be harder, but it's going to be tough, but I think everything's going to be tough. On the positive side, 
I do believe that clients and marketers are desperate for new ways of thinking and new ideas and companies that do that will do that well. So it's a mixed bag, but right now, I think it'll be smaller, but still very relevant. That's great. Hey, quick follow up on that, Rashad, and then we'll go back to questions. Um, does this bode well, again, agency specific, does this bode well for unbundling, rebundling? You know, does the time ahead push for, uh, you know, agencies to think about creative and, and media together again? Um, I don't even, it just sort of popped into my head and I haven't thought about so it, but I'm curious I, I, about you. I think, see, I, think, I think there was a tendency for, for, for this to come together anyway, because what all the companies were doing and everyone had sort of the s different names for the same thing, right? Whether it was team or power of one or whatever, was right. how do you basically uh, put together things better for a client? And there were two, one, one is because you needed people to work together the other is you needed to basically eliminate and clients were not going to pay for any duplicative costs or for internal friction. There's no price for that. Uh, and there were ways to put it together. However, you want to make sure what you're putting together is actually really different skill sets versus the same skill set. So what I mean is when you go to Baskin Robbins, right, there's chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream, strawberry ice cream and you decide what you want to have or some combination, you don't say, I want all 32 flavors together in one goo, right. right? And it's very, very important that some of this integration isn't integrating into goo when there isn't skill set because skill sets are important. So how you come that together. So I think that is going to be one of the things that we're all going to basically sort of work at. No, indeed. Uh, Josh? Yeah, so, so Rashad, we had a question. The person couldn't join via video, but they were asking about, brands taking new risks on new media platforms and new types of content that comes from this. So as a small media company, we're obviously hosting more of these round tables. We're producing more content. Do you think brands will, while the budgets are smaller, invest in new media platforms faster than they once or were before? I think they will. And I think, you know, one of the jokes going around is you know, who best transformed your organization, your CEO, your CFO, your chief digital officer or COVID-19, and it's basically mm -hmm. COVID-19. And, but it's, it's gonna be pretty dramatic. Just before this, I was doing a two hour session with leadership of a very well-regarded company. And you know, one of the key issues was most of us are starting to create content much cheaper. And, and there was a, there's a story in my book about my daughter made a movie and I was like running around as the key gaffer or whatever. And I realized how the economics had changed so dramatically. And in many ways, when you actually think about it, the idea of having massive studios and massive things, right? People are going to say like, why? Including by the way, very senior people in organization. So senior people in organization are two types. One are senior people who understand technology and the other one who basically pretend they understand technology. The ones who pretend they understand technology are now going to be understanding it a little bit more because of this experience. And they're going to basically ask, why are we doing things the same way? You know, just like at least I read with, you know, which is um, Bob Iger, who sort of come back to be the CEO of Disney. He says, I'm, I have to create a Disney with fewer people. And I also have to basically say, why am I doing stupid things like TV upfronts? Right. Yeah. What do you think that means for something like Quibi, where, you know, again, high production value, high cost, and especially now, sh very short format meant to be consumed in between travel and meetings? So when I first heard about Quibi, my, my thing was, it's either going to be a great success or it's going to be a great failure. And the reason for the great success was obviously the people behind it who are amazingly successful, brilliant people, right? And their networks and their connections and the fact that storytelling can be very important and some of their supposed technology. Having played around with it once it's come out, I am now in the basic belief we are going to see a great failure, right? And that's primarily because the stuff sucks. The content sucks. Okay. And my whole basic belief is the content just sucks. And now when you, and in effect, they've taken away choice from me because you know, you can't, you can only see it on a mobile device. So we're all sitting at home watching television, right? It doesn't allow you to use airplay. It doesn't allow you to use anything. So they've said, we know better. So what they've actually ended up doing is they've used huge budgets to provide crap. So I wish, and especially in a place where people are budget conscious. So I have a feeling that it ain't going to work and it's going to go down basically as a 
failure. No. Oh, okay. Um, and let's go to, uh, looks like, let me turn on your video. Uh, Colette Brooks had a question. I'm unmuting you, turning on your video. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Hello. So, hi there. Um, I have a thought about Quibi, that Quibi may not be for you and I, and I've been experiencing it also, and I share your sentiment. Um, it actually, it, it might be for Gen Z because this is what they use. So I don't know, jury's out. Uh, the only problem with Gen Z is that they have other things to do, including TikTok. True. Right? True. And my whole basic belief is Quibi is not better than TikTok. Right, <laughs> right, be interesting. So my, my question is actually uh, kind of going back to um, um, uh, Drew, your your comment about the discount economy. And if yeah. that's really in the cards, isn't this going to inform a domino effect downstream, mm -hmm. like lower margins, higher unemployment, less consumer spending? So can, can you speak to that? So there, lower prices doesn't necessarily mean lower margins because, right? It, it could mean there's less margin to go around, but some companies might, we may actually move to a higher margin economy. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the reasons to sort of explain, right? And obviously today the market is down, right? But when you basically sort of think that the market is off now 15% versus 38%. So what are people basically thinking? right? Which is when you actually think about this is likely to be longer, et cetera. And who knows, nobody knows where the market's going to go. I think the first thing what people are beginning to realize is the companies that are going to be dominating are going to be bigger, mm. right? Bigger companies tend to have scale-based economies. Mm. Number two is the ability to have radical competition to a certain extent disappears for a little while because people don't fund a lot of these startups, which is, which is important. Third is the most successful companies supposedly are giving you stuff for free, but are the most powerful, right? So there's, there's sort of different econo economies that doesn't matter. What I think will, will basically happen is there'll be a recalibrating of the economy, which is regardless of who gets elected in, you know, next year or this November and therefore takes over next year. It's going to be one where there is going to be a redistribution of wealth from people who don't spend it to people who have to spend it. So, so what, is, what we also have to realize is most of the wealth is in 10% of the United States, but they save most of their money, right? And a lot of people don't have ends to meet. There is going to be redistribution because either you have redistribution or you're gonna have a revolution. Um, Josh, someone sent me a, a question privately, which I do think is interesting. I'd like to throw in here. Um, Rashad, your thoughts on, on this on the impact on, on education? Um, you know, and, and particularly, uh, you know, Rita was talking last week about what is the value of a digital or virtual course? You know, should I be paying $80,000 a year to go to Harvard Business School or whatever, you know, but whether it's on the high end and the very premium type of, of high end education or, or just education in general, I'm not sure if you thought much about this, um, but um, no, any, I, any, I, any I, thoughts? Yeah, I've thought a lot, a, a bit about this because I actually you know, do a lot of work with the University of Chicago where I went to school. Um, and right now, for instance, you probably know that between 70 to 80% of the students at Wharton, Stanford, and others have demanded that their fees be returned to them for this past quarter, right? right? And the big argument right now is they're basically saying we are, because at Stanford or University of Chicago, in your entire education, including living and housing, costs $250,000 for two years. Right. So what they're basically saying is, hey, I want my 40 or $30,000 back for this thing. The universities are basically saying we actually provide greater value and you're getting a great deal because in effect, you aren't actually paying your full thing. It's coming out from endowments and all of that. And our endowments are down. What I think is going to basically happen is the following. Universities are going to have to take significant cost cuts because the reality of it is 75 to 80 percent of the dollars that go to universities have got nothing to do with education. They basically got to keep a whole bunch of people employed who should not be employed and build all kinds of buildings that nobody needs, which is which is number one. Number two is a lot of schools. We've seen this in the business school thing, but you're going to see elsewhere. Many business schools have closed down. 
Many business schools have moved to one year programs. There's no, you could do one full year. It's the same as in you know, a six semesters to save money. So there's going to be that. But this is the biggest thing with all the Zoom. And what you miss for education, which is very important, is you learn a lot from your fellow classmates. And you're going to have to, that, that can never be totally replaced. But, it, but what is going to happen, and this is the key thing, is people are going to realize that either we go to the very best schools or we go to a local craft school that's very good, or we just go online. Because people are beginning to realize you can get the best online. Why the hell am I paying $25,000 for tier two? Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, right. And one of the things I, I'll tell you, this is the biggest problem of one of the things we have to realize is remember there is a winner take all thing, which you're beginning to see, obviously with the large tech companies, I think you're going to see with the universities, you're going to see this across the board. So for instance, people, when, when, let's suppose you, you, do, you speak for a living. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, what basically begins to happen, if you speak for a living and you're a Zoomable and Skypeable speaker, you can do seven or eight of these at a relatively low cost, and you can take a whole bunch of people out of business. Right. And, and so that's, what's, that's the thing. What you're basically beginning to see is inventory, right? Demand mm -hmm. could, could become global, but many businesses are going to have this limited inventory, which is in effect, you know, people can go and get the justice course from Harvard and the happiness course from Yale, et cetera. Interesting. Uh, Josh, let's get back to some other questions. Great. Um, we have an audio question from Natasha. She's in India and has, I guess, poor bandwidth. So we're just going to bring her in via audio. Natasha, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Uh, Josh, am I audible? Yes. yes. Great. Great. Hi, Richard, Natasha. Hi. We are connected on LinkedIn, and I had recently read your book and, and left a comment as well. And, and it's beautiful. Uh, I, I guess it's just well-timed with the economy right now. <laughs> yes, what uh, basically happens, it was out of stock. It's back in stock, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, uh, Richard, my question to you is more pertinent for India and um, the IT tech startups and the ones who are already settled in the business. Um, what I see from the various CIO forums that I have attended so far uh, through webinars, um, there are organizations which are tech savvy, but they haven't even thought about using technology to, to transform their workplace. And what I hear from them is they're still struggling to do it, to adapt to the, to the, to the gig economy and to the virtual economy. Uh, but at the same time, I do not see a mindset uh, of the CEOs in terms of taking this transition and transformation forward. So uh, what's your view on the developing economies, uh, uh, you know, in terms of how do you see uh, them coming out of this and, and taking it as a positive stride? I, I, here's what's happening is, you know, right now, I think like in India, this is going on at least till May 4th, but I think it might go later. Okay. But so I think we've just completed, uh, because I'm from India, so I keep aware of what's going on there is we've completed three of the five weeks. What I'm beginning to see is I'm you're, you're, for behavior to change, you need about four to six weeks. So I began to see CEO behavior change in the United States last week. Because after about three, four, four to six weeks of this, people are beginning to change. I'm beginning to see, for instance, my mother-in-law in India, right now, and, and she's actually forward thinking, but now she's zooming all over the place and she's in her 80s. Okay, so what is I think is going to happen is you'd be surprised at how this will happen. This will change in two, three weeks. Like if this goes past May 4th, which I think it will, you're going to see this in May. In May. The other is, unfortunately, I do believe that the emerging markets are going to get hit much worse because as you know, in India, for instance, 90 million families live in one room, right? So the whole idea of staying in one room doesn't make sense. So I think this is going to recalibrate India in a very good way. And I know you've got low bandwidth, but I have a faith belief that Mukesh Ambani and Geo is going to make a big deal of this. Uh, Rashad, just a little bit more on sort of leadership there. And you talked about CEOs and becoming, you know, technologically savvy or pretending, but more broadly on leadership, particularly if maybe people aren't in the office as much anymore, or, you know, what are going to be the, the traits of a great leader uh, for, from a business standpoint in, in sort of this revised work environment and, and the future of work? Um, and so are there going to be new skills that need to be acquired by the, by, by the C-suite? And, and whether I manage an office of five people and uh, I've got a so, so I think so, supply the, company or something. Yeah. So one of the, 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 the key things that, you know, in, in 
when I was doing my book, one of the things I did is I went to like 50% of the time, which fortunately my company allowed me to do for about a year, more than a year, so I could research for the book. So the book wasn't just like me doing normal shit that I do. And what tends to, tended to basically happen is I was studying leadership, not only what I'd observed, people I'd reported to, clients, but I read a lot about leadership and I brought it down to just five ingredients. And then I stress tested those five ingredients in today and I found those five are even more right, right? So here are the five ingredients. And this is not just about being a leader, but it's also about the messaging that you do and every part of your life now. And here are the five. The first one is capability. Good leaders are capable. And right now, a lot of people, remember, a lot of people say, give me the ball coach, right? This, yeah, so yeah. this is it. We are now in the foundry and the furnace of business. This is when real leaders stand up and real leaders are capable. And you can basically tell today, and I will not go anywhere in the political landscape, when you don't have capability, how it shows or when it shows. And you can check it versus your governor, versus your president, versus your mayor. Okay, just try that. So capability happens to be one. The other four are the following. One is integrity. And integrity includes facts, belief in science, trust, transparency. The third one is empathy, right? Can you actually feel for something besides yourself? The fourth one is vulnerability, which is can you tell people that you don't have a clue, that you yourself are scared, that you are, right? And the fifth one is inspiration, which is can you give people clarity, energy, and belief in themselves and hope after this? So those are the five. And when you actually think about those five, those are more needed today than ever before. Capability, you know, empathy, right. integrate, vulnerability, and um, inspiration. And inspiration, yeah. Um, well, let's get back to some questions. Thank you for that, Rashad. I wrote those okay. five down, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so, yeah, let's go uh, to uh, Mark Blumenthal. Hey, Mark, you're on. Hi, uh, Rashad. Thanks so much for taking my question. So my question is this. How will the significant increase in poverty here in the United States and elsewhere, or shall we say the have-nots, impact the capitalist system as we know it and business in general? So... The the basic idea of capitalism, which has been around for a long time, but has been uh, pushed forth dramatically over the last few years, has basically been from the University of Chicago. So University of Chicago, Milton Friedman, the Chicago School, etc. What people don't realize is about five, six years ago, the Chicago School started to change. And their basic belief was, how do we save capitalism from the capitalists? Because in effect, right. capitalism is really about competition and capitalism is basically by, uh, about having a free market that works. And when free markets work, you need trampolines, which when something doesn't work out and you need ladders, which is called education. And what has tended to basically happen is, uh, I was just talking to uh, Raghu Rajan, who is a major professor. He used to be the Reserve Bank governor of India and the head of the IMF. And he's written a book called The Third Pillar. And it's all about community and people. So I think what you're going to basically see is capitalism is going to basically get back to be what it's supposed to be. And what's really interesting is the world, including the United States, thrived very well, by the way, in the, in, uh, between the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. And it was a capitalistic thing, but there were things like unions. So for instance, one of the things I'm anticipating is there are going to be unions again. Because, because people are going to basically, who are working out there, are going to say, okay, people have put us in, we, they pay us nothing and we're almost going to kill ourselves. So you're going to see all kinds of stuff. So I truly believe that we're going to move to a place where capitalism isn't about I, me, mine, but capitalism is basically allowing innovation, allowing people to grow wealth. But only way to do it is you need to basically have a society. So just like I've basically always said that, you know, these Googles and Facebooks are not advertising operating systems, they're society operating systems. I've always believed that we need to focus on and optimize for the citizen and not for the consumer, which happens to be capitalistic. Yep. I know we have about 10 minutes left, so I'd, I'd like to at least get to one or two more questions here. Sure. So um, Azim had sent in a question, asked me to ask uh, Rashad, your thoughts on, you know, the geopolitical implications uh, of the current crisis and how this will impact, you know, business and trade going forward. 
Yeah, so, and I'd like to just add on to that in, in, more, in, in terms of context, Rashad, just sort of your view. You've had such great global experiences, not just working for a French company, but traveling all over the world. On top of that or with that, you know, impact on the global sort of consumer and other markets and, and sure. as well. Yeah. So, so first of all, you know, fundamentally, let me basically say that I think global, globalization is unstoppable. Okay. And it, it's, been, it's been a minority opinion even two till COVID-19, and now people think I've turned insane. But let me explain to you why, okay? The first thing is globalization took 2 billion people out of poverty. That's number one. Number two, the, people, the things that we're trying to stop, we basically believe that the West with 850 million people can tell 6.2 billion people how to do stuff, right? But globalization is of different flavors. It's not just a United States flavor or a European flavor. That's the first thing. Second is do recognize, as I've always told people, immigrants are not crossing the border. It's basically people who are running from bullets who are crossing the border. Most immigrants are coming on planes, so you can't build a 32,000 foot wall. But as importantly, this virus, whatever you call it, right? It came from a different part of the world. It came into the United States. No, no, you could stop planes, nothing stopped it. The reality of it is, as long as the virus is anywhere, it's everywhere. The biggest mistake we're making is not looking at this as something that we have to solve globally. So this getting out of who is the stupidest thing that anybody could actually do. This is a world problem, right? Everything's a world problem. The reality of it is if you close your borders and give up, nobody has jobs, their economies crash and they come going into the, in the countries that, that work well. So the, the reality of it is we are globally interconnected whether we like it or not. However, what we have to basically do is we've got to have resilience in the system. And so therefore, I believe that you're going to constantly see two models. And therefore, I've said the future, unlike Andy Grove, who basically said only the paranoid will survive, which makes no sense in a connected world, right? I believe only the schizophrenic will thrive, uh, which basically means you will simultaneously see two models and you'll see the mongrelization of everything. So you'll basically have There'll be nothing like a digital company and there'll be nothing like an offline company. All companies will be Mongols. There'll be no like pure breeds, right? Very much like when everybody marries, there'll be Mongols. So that's the, the whole thing. So what tends to basically happen is I truly believe that you're gonna see nationalist community driven things and a global thing, not one or the other, but fundamentally almost all advances are global. Technology is global. Fine, you can build a China wall, right? And then you can build the rest of the world, but it's primarily global. Biotechnology is global. You, if, you're, if you're gonna have no travel, you're gonna basically have a big problem. So all of tourism, which is 11% of the world's economy, closes, right? So interestingly, it's very easy to basically say the other person sucks and immigrants suck and globalization sucks and calling this virus like, you know, Chinese virus. Get over it. We are human beings first and we're global. And then we have to obviously recognize we live in a society. And what we don't have, we don't have a globalization problem. We have a goddamn leadership problem. We got sucky leaders. We better vote properly. Right. Um... Drew's on mute. Hold on, Drew. You're, uh... I was just going to say, let's do one more. I think uh, one more question, and then we'll start to wrap up. Sure. Let's go over to uh, Bruce Branfon had a question. Bruce, you should uh, be unmuted now, and please start your video if you can. Uh, sure. Uh, there's my video. Hey, Rashad, okay. thank you so Hi. much. This is amazing, as always, uh, these, and thank you, Techonomy. And CDX, this is super. Um, you know, my question really, uh, you know, and, and, it, and it pales in comparison with your last comment, so forgive me for being prosaic, uh, but, but was part of the shift on the marketing side for, happened when agencies began to be rewarded for the, the cost of acquisition of media as opposed to the quality of the messaging that they were creating? What's your opinion about that? I, I, I think what, what basically happened is, I've been through all the sort of phases what what tended to happen is, yeah, we used to get paid in a very strange and very unusual way for outcome. And we started getting paid for input, and which we then sort of sort of sort of sort of spotly outcome. What do I mean? In the old days, and I'm not saying we didn't necessarily come back, 
But what you, we, we used to get a commission on all media spent. And it didn't matter what media you did, you just paid a commission. And when the client spent more, your fees went up. And when the client spent less, your fees went down. And you, you basically did not spend 20 to 30% of your manpower running budgets and Excel spreadsheets and FTEs and dealing with procurement. So I believe about 15 to 20% of most companies, not just agency companies, 15 to 20%, you know, when you think about friction is a bunch of people running Excel spreadsheets, which should be burnt. So what, that, and it's just not our business. It's every business. Like what the, what, you know, there's a famous book which says that most jobs are fake. I don't think most jobs are fake. I think one out of every four jobs are fake. Okay. Which are completely made up jobs. So all of this is that. But one of the key things is we therefore were built on basically what your expenses were. And so what did, uh, your costs were. So everybody was basically about cost. And we lost the plot that the business was really about not just ideas, but about driving outcomes. And, and even, even being paid like on leads and all that is very stupid because most businesses that have lots of leads have turned out to have useless businesses. Okay, uh, I've been studying all of this, which is if you go the second level of math, but what I think we now need to get back to is some form of like partnership, not only between agencies and clients or between clients and their other suppliers, but the, the entire idea is if the only way you can grow your business is by being cannibalistic with your partners, you don't have a business, right? My whole stuff is cannibalism is not healthy. And what we were basically doing in different systems is we were cannibalizing each other versus actually going and hunting in the jungle for some animal, maybe the bat that bit whoever did this to us, right? That kind of thing. That's great, Rashad, vivid as always. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're gonna wrap up here, but, uh, you know, sort of our parting uh, shot for me, just, you know, um, it's hard because we, we've never been through something like this, as you said, this is unique. Um, uh, and, and everybody's health and safety is of course most important. Um, but thinking about that consumer on the other side, what are the signals that people can look for in regards to what this world will look like on the other side? And we, we didn't really talk about me asking this question of you, so I'll drag it on just a bit so you can start to think about it. Um, but what does that consumer society look like or our society in general, but what are the signals we can look for? Where, where can we get hints as to how things are going to evolve? So, you know, I, I think it's primarily look at people as people that look at people as humans. And I've always basically believed that what people are looking for is number one, they're looking for purpose, which is what, what do they do a good job, right? They're looking for connections, both connections, which are family connections, friends, they're looking for that. And most important, they're looking for growth, both financial, economic, and human growth. And those are the fundamental things that people are looking for. And if you can deliver that to them with some form of safety and security that's good for society, you win.